Welcome all and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Michael Downey and it's great to be back for another AWRI webinar. This is the third of five webinars designed to assist growers who are dealing with the effects of recent bushfires. And in today's session, we'll take a look at what you should consider when purchasing grapevine planting material. These sessions were formed as part of the vineyard mapping and assessment project that was created in response to the Cudley Creek and Kangaroo Island bushfires. The project has been led by Wine Grape Council of South Australia with support from Primary Industries and Regions SA and was funded by the South Australian Wine Industry Development Scheme and approved by the Ministry, Minister for Primary Industries and Regional Development, Tim Whetstone. The project has been supported by the following stakeholders, the AWRI, SARDI, Vine Health Australia, University of Adelaide, University, uh, Adelaide Hills Wine Region and Rural Directions. But before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders for anyone new to AWRI webinars. To provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send. We will be running a dedicated Q&A at the end of the presentation, but feel free to send through your questions at any stage. Uh, also, just a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view via the AWRI's YouTube channel. Uh, for anyone that's just joined, welcome. Um, there's much to consider when purchasing grapevine planting material, so it's great to have Nick Dry from Foundation Viticulture with us today, who will explore these factors in detail. Nick managed Yolumba Nursery for 11 years and developed an extensive knowledge of, knowledge of variety, clone and rootstock performance, along with an intimate understanding of grapevine trunk disease and grapevine virus and nursery practice, practices. In September 29, he was awarded the Gourmet Traveller Viticulturist of the Year. And later that year, he started his own consulting business called Foundation Viticulture. Nick, thank you for joining today. It's fantastic to have your expertise on hand. And if you're ready to go, I'll hand over to you to make a start. Thank you, Michael. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I will just get that started. There we are. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, now I've got a lot to cover, so settle back, get comfortable, and um, yeah, let's make a start. So whether you are a corporate wine behemoth or a small boutique vineyard, healthy planting material is the foundation on which you build your business success. So the aim of today's presentation is to arm you with knowledge so that you can find the information ask the right questions and make informed decisions to maximize your opportunities for sourcing healthy planting material. And in doing so, get your vineyard producing maximum yields and optimal quality as soon as possible. Uh, so in the presentation, I'm going to cover uh, the different planting material products. What are they and what are the associated relative benefits and risks? Uh, maximizing quality assurance and minimizing risk. What questions do I need to ask my nursery? What is the current situation with planting material availability? And where can you access information on the clones and rootstocks? And finally, I will provide some very general advice on site preparation and planting. So let's get started. Um, so what products are available? Well, the first product is dormant rootlings. So dormant as in supplied out of the cool room as a dormant product and rootlings because the product is supplied with developed and lignified roots. This product is propagated and calloused in the nursery and then grown in a field nursery. And so when it comes to supply, it is already one year old. The age and dormant aspect is a big positive. It means that they have high levels of carbohydrates compared with the other products. And this means they can better buffer against adverse soil and environmental conditions. And because they're lifted in winter and stored as a dormant product, you can either plant earlier in the season and exploit the full growing season to fill out as much of the cordon as possible, or they can be supplied later in the season, depending on frost risks or, other, or any other factors. So there's a degree of flexibility with this product. The only negative of a dormant ruling is that there is a long lead time. So to put that in perspective, you order in autumn year one. So let's say autumn 2020, um, the nursery will propagate those vines in uh, the spring of 2020. 
The vines are then grown in the field nursery across the summer and into the autumn of 2021. The vines are then lifted in winter 2021 and then supplied in say early or sometime in spring 2021. So this means that there's close to a 15 to 18 month supply cycle for this product. So you really need to make sure that you're getting in early um, and putting your orders in early. So in summary, for me, dormant rootlings should always be considered the first choice product. But as I said, you must order well in advance to make sure that you get the variety clone rootstock combination um, of, of your choice, your preferred variety clone rootstock combination. So the next product that is available is the potted vine, also uh, known as a green vine or a green top or a spring band. So the positive this, of this product is that it is propagated and supplied in the same season. So you can order in autumn and receive the product in late spring. And this is achieved by accelerating growth in a greenhouse and then hardening in a shade house prior to supply. Um, but because the product is only 10 to 12 weeks old at planting, it is only partially lignified. The other important point to consider is that um, it's supplied later in the season when it is potentially hotter and drier. The relative use of this product makes it less robust than a dormant rootling and therefore it requires more management inputs and the later planting means there's a low tolerance of difficult environments and low margin for error. So in summary, with a, a green vine or a potted vine, I've seen plenty of successful plantings but they need good soil and soil preparation and meticulous follow-up management. Definitely consider using grow guards and make sure you push your nursery to propagate your order in the earlier rounds so that you can receive them earlier and avoid, you know, the absolute heat that starts to occur with, um, you know, late November and early December plantings. You should always uh, also expect a higher attrition rate with a potted vine compared with a dormant rootling. So make sure you order replants for the following season, preferably as a dormant rootling, and you should work on somewhere between five and 7%. So yes, potted vines can be done well, uh, but when it goes badly, it is an expensive exercise. And sometimes, even if you've done all the work, all the right preparation, and the nursery supplied a quality product, if you get a heat wave accompanied by a roaring northerly right on planting, then it can all go poorly despite the best work of all parties involved. So the third product is callus cuttings. So all propagation material starts with callusing. And so this product essentially skips the field nursery or greenhouse phase and it goes straight to the vineyard. Uh, as a result, it's relatively cheap. There's a quick turnaround and they're easy to plant because they don't have any roots. The potential negatives, well, you're managing this product from a juvenile stage, so they will require more management inputs. They have a low tolerance for difficult soil and environmental conditions because they don't have developed roots or high levels of carbohydrate storage, and they need close to ideal soil conditions. And you must have a robust and very well functioning irrigation system. At most sites, if you miss an irrigation or two or have blocked drippers, you will lose vines. Timing of planting also needs to be considered. So it needs the soil temperature needs to be not too cold and the environment needs to be not too hot. Uh, and there needs to be some soil moisture in the ground, preferably. And this normally coincides with mid-October. Important to consider that at this stage of the plant's development, there is no margin for error. So again, I have seen plenty of vineyards that have been well established with callus cuttings, but there are also plenty of horror stories. Don't go down this pathway because it is a cheap option alone. Do it because you have the right soil type, a robust irrigation system, and you're committed to managing this juvenile product. And finally, be prepared for failure. Have a backup plan. Okay, so they're our nursery products and I hope that gives you a good overview of what they are and the points to consider when making a decision. We'll move on to quality assurance and risk management. Now, I don't want to sound dramatic, uh, but it's 
really important to remind you that bringing planting material onto your vineyard is one of your biggest threats to vineyard biosecurity. If the plant material comes with a pathogen, then it is probably there for the life of the block and obviously may spread into the rest of the vineyard. Now, no nursery is going to guarantee freedom from pathogens. And this, what, this is why it is extra important to understand how to maximize quality insurance and minimize your risk. And this can be done by asking the right questions of your nursery. The first question to ask of the nursery is, are you accredited? Uh, and this could be either with VENA, which is the Vine Industry Nursery Association, uh, NIASA, which is the Nursery Industry Accreditation Scheme, or it could be a quality management scheme like ISO 9001. Now, again, accreditation doesn't guarantee freedom from pest or pathogen, but it does display that the nursery is run with a degree of professionalism, has quality systems in place, um, has product traceability and understands the principles of propagation. So for me, accreditation is a good first step to minimising your risk. Now, in terms of pathogens and pests and virus, well, the, the major biosecurity threats are, are grapevine virus, grapevine trunk disease pathogens and sore-borne pests. And Today, I'm going to focus on uh, GTDs or grapevine trunk diseases and virus because in terms of soil borne pests, um, phylloxera uh, is well covered by state regulations and uh, the other soil borne pest nematodes are well controlled with hot water treatment, which I'll talk about a bit um, later. So we're gonna start with grapevine virus. So which viruses should you be concerned with? Well. I mean, this could be you know, a 20 minute presentation in itself, so I can't really go into too much detail, but this is a good overview slide here. You can see, um, and I've highlighted the, um, what have I got, the three viruses uh, of concern. So there's leaf roll one, uh, which leads to potential lower yield, light red wine color, higher acidity and inferior wine quality. Leaf roll three, lower yield, less color, higher acidity, inferior wine quality and GVA, which can impact through grafting compatibility um, and uh, can definitely impact if you are grafting Shiraz onto GVA infected vines. Um, GPGV is also listed there. Um, we're still getting a handle on what those effects might be of this virus. Um, but for me, really, uh, leaf roll three is the biggest concern. It's a virus that is easily spread via commonly found vineyard vectors, merely bug and scale. And importantly, it severely impacts yield and wine quality. So that's, that's your key. Anything going to take away on virus, leaf roll three, you know, that's the bad one. So there's some really good information um, on the Wine Australia website, uh, which looks at uh, viruses of grapevines. So there's a link there um, to follow up with at a later stage. So how to keep virus out of your young vineyard? Well, I know from experience that leaf roll three virus can survive in remnant roots after vineyards have been removed. And so, and then it can transfer into clean planting material in new plantings via subterranean mealybugs. So protecting your new vineyard from virus actually begins before you remove the old vineyard. And this can be done with surveillance of the to be removed vineyard for virus symptoms. Uh, and this is best done in late autumn, in the weeks uh, after harvest, but before leaf form. Um, this works best for red varieties, but um, it's still worth surveilling your vineyard, even if you've got white varieties, because there can be some symptoms. Uh, testing, of course, can also confirm the presence and identify which of the viruses um, it may be. And I would highly recommend that if leaf roll three is found, then you need to put a management system into place to, first of all, remove the remnant roots, uh, because this is where the virus uh, source is. And then you need to look at a program to control the vectors, i.e. the subterranean mealybugs. Now, there isn't much um, reported information on control measures, and I'm happy to discuss um, with anyone at a later stage. So grapevine virus, minimum standards to reduce risk. So to minimize the risk of virus in your planting material, you need to make sure that the following has been undertaken. So the first thing is source block inspections. 
So for red varieties, source block inspections post-harvest, so in that period post-harvest and before leaf fall, is incredibly successful in identifying leaf roll virus symptoms. So you need to make sure source block inspections have taken place. For white varieties, again, it's more difficult to observe the symptoms, so it's less effective, but it's still good practice. The second thing, regular testing should cover the three major viruses, leaf roll one, leaf roll three, and GVA. And there should also be evidence of virus tests that cover the full spectrum of all the grapevine viruses, so you know what you're dealing with. So if you're just doing leaf roll one, leaf roll three, and GVA, and they might be clean of that, but if you're not doing the full spectrum, you may not know that you might have leaf roll two, leaf roll nine, leaf roll, and all the leaf roll four strains and fleck as well. So you really want to know uh, about all of the viruses. Uh, and so you can make an informed decision on whether you want these, um, albeit lower risk viruses in your vineyard. So just to reiterate, leaf roll one, leaf roll three, and GVA should be done regularly on a you know almost an annual basis for a source block but every five to seven years there should be a full spectrum test testing for all the viruses so you, you you know what you're getting yourself into in terms of sampling it should take place at at least 0.5 percent of the vineyard per year per year and you know obviously um higher is better um, you know, in an ideal world as well, um, you know, 0.5% should identify and uncover any endemic problems with virus. Um, but again, yes, higher would be better. And there is some movement uh, in vine improvement to look at a risk assessment approach for source blocks, um, rather than just having a blanket rule of 0.5% per year. So no, I think that's a, a very positive step going forward. So obviously, um, there should be a history of negative tests for the negative results for the source block for the main virus types. If there is a positive test in the past, then you know ask for a different source block. Uh, if this is not possible, then there needs to be evidence enough of roguing or removal of infected and surrounding vines, further high frequency testing and vector management to satisfy you that the risk is low. Again, even if all of these minimum standards uh, are met, it still doesn't guarantee freedom of virus, but it will reduce your risk. Moving on to grapevine trunk disease. Um, which grapevine trunk diseases should you be concerned with? Um, well, again, you know, this could be another 20 minute presentation in itself, but uh, you should focus on Botrosferia or Botcanker. Uh, Fay acrimonia, otherwise known as Petri disease or black goo, uh, cylindrocarpin, which is black foot, and agrobacterium crown gall. Um, look, you know, you can Google uh, grapevine trunk diseases and find a whole range of um, technical information. Here's a couple of links to some papers that, um, that I've used in the past. <clears throat> Um, so infections of any of these uh, pathogens can lead to poor vine performance, inability to deal with environmental stress, vine decline, and sometimes vine death. Um, fortunately, we don't have too many problems with grapevine trunk disease in planting material, um, as is seen with other wine producing countries. And I think this is part to do with the relatively widespread adoption of hot water treatment generally good levels of nursery hygiene and our typically drier growing conditions. Uh, unfortunately, with grapevine trunk disease, unlike virus, there isn't an easy way to sample and test for GTDs. The only way to test is in a destructive manner and apart from rendering the plant deceased, uh, it's not always conclusive, especially if you are inexperienced in the process of dissecting a grapevine, a young grapevine. So GTDs, they enter plant material when nurseries create points of infection uh, or wound sites during the propagation process. And, and these are necessary, this is part of propagation. So points of infection include damage to canes during the growing season, uh, at the point of taking the cutting during the propagation process, in particular disbudding, bottom cutting and grafting, and then in the field nursery through trimming or infections through the base of the vine. These points of infections need to be managed by removing the pathogens from the propagation environment, 
or by applying treatments to limit the opportunity to either enter or maintain the infection. So uh, with that in mind, these are the minimum standards that should be followed to help reduce the opportunities for grapevine trunk disease to enter and infect young plant material. Hot water treatment is critical um, and will also help with controlling nematodes and the roots of root, root, root that come from the roots uh, from the field nursery. Uh, so 50 degrees for 30 minutes for cuttings and root lengths should be minimum of 52 degrees for five minutes. Uh, good nursery hygiene. And, and this really um, plays to the fact that you should be developing relationships with your nursery. Go visit the nursery. Um, does the nursery look clean? Are benches being wiped down regularly? Are machines being cleaned regularly? Uh, so hygiene, really important. And really the only way you're going to find out is by asking questions or going there and having a look. Um, pathogens can build up in nursery soil. So field nursery rotation should occur after uh, three years or um, if nurseries are going back into that same soil, soils should, should be fumigated. And finally, inspections of plant material prior to planting should be undertaken, undertaken by the nursery. Uh, so through you know, um, quality control processes. And you know, really there's no reason why you can't do this uh, yourself. Um, and go and visit the nursery and have a look at the material before you actually receive it. And this just adds another layer of quality assurance. I wanna make it clear that ultimately, it's up to you to set the quality standards. Um, and you can do this by working closely with the nursery or by finding someone who can be a conduit to the nursery, such as myself or other experienced uh, consultants. So moving on to availability of planting material. Um, I've spoken to a number of nurseries uh, to get an indication of availability so for, for supply and demand for 2020 and beyond. But do not take what I'm about to say as gospel because circumstances change in the nursery, in the nursery world, even in more stable times. So I would encourage you to get on the phone and get the information firsthand. But as a general indication, 2020 supply of rootlings, both grafted and own rooted, is relatively limited. Um, but uh, changing as customers cancel or alter their plans based on their exposure to different markets. I have heard that the recent rains are encouraging planting, so this may make up for the effects of um, the cancellation or of amendments of orders based on um, effects of you know, coronavirus. Regardless, if you haven't ordered for 2020, you are reliant on whatever the nursery has available rather than what your preferred clone or rootstock may be. Glasshouse space for potted vines for 2020 is also currently pretty limited in the two major South Australian nurseries. And remember that you can't access potted vines from interstate. For 2021 supply, I would strongly encourage you to place orders as soon as possible. There is some lim limitations on access to Paulson. Uh, because there is a lot of demand for this rootstock by table grape, uh, by the table grape industry. Uh, but there does still appear to be access to cool climate rootstocks such as 10114, 5C, Teleki and Schwarzman. You, you really just need to get on the phone and ring around um, to accredited nurseries and, and find out what's available. Uh, and of course, there's still opportunities to order own rooted vines. In terms of clone availability, the only issue that I could see um, is the loss of access to D4V2 Penenwile, which was bushfire affected. So in summary, uh, 2020 limited, order now for 2021. Okay, so selection of clone and root stocks. So this can be a daunting experience because of the range of options. Um, so what I wanted to do here is just provide some resources to help. So for rootstock selection, there is the updated rootstock selection, which was um, originally developed by Lumber Nursery and then Wine Australia um, took that on board and, and put um, uh, some money into that and funding and um, uh, put a, a, a large update um, to that rootstock selector. So um, that can be found at uh, grapevinerootstock.com. Um, grapevine rootstocks, uh, selection and management for South Australian vineyards. Uh, this is 13 years old now, I think, um, but still very relevant. Um, I'm a bit biased, you know, obviously being the author, but um, a very uh, a good um, resource. Uh, if you don't have a, a, a copy, and mind you, I'm not getting any proceeds from this, so I'm not like, you know, 
I'm not uh, marketing myself here, but uh, I did a quick check and you can purchase it from the book depository secondhand for $28 and 74 cents. And I think that's worth every cent. Um, and finally, don't forget to use your local networks uh, to access information on performance in your region. So speak to your neighbors, speak to your friends, speak to other people in your region um, who have, um, you know, different rootstocks in the ground to get a feel for how they're performing and which ones may be better suited to your site. Okay, in terms of clone selection, um, again, I might be a bit biased because I worked there for uh, 12 or so years, but I think Yulama Nursery, they've been undertaking trials, um, clonal trials, including winemaking for many years. And they have the most extensive library on clone performance in Australia. Um, so I think they're a really good place to start. Um, River Sun Nursery in New Zealand actually has an excellent website, which obviously doesn't always correlate with uh, the clones that are available in Australia, but it's still worth um, you know, having a look at to see if any of the clones that you're interested in are, um, uh, are on that website. Into web searches. So um, they'll often bring up PDFs of presentations and here are some um, links to a WRI regional workshops of presentations that um, I have done on Pinot Noir, uh, Chardonnay, and uh, the third one there is Shiraz. Um, and again, um, I'll put away my modesty and say that, of course, um, they're excellent sources of information. And again, don't forget to use your local networks for information. Um, you know, clone and rootstock performance is, you know, regionally specific. So there, there should be plenty of um, opportunities out there to, to get some good local information. So um, we're getting close to the end. Um, the last section is on soil preparation and planting. And it's a short section. Um, I would just want to say that the growth potential of a healthy rootling is high. And I know this because I've seen how much growth can occur in year one while in the field nursery, uh, as evidenced by the, the picture you see on the right, that rootling with the long roots. So I've seen uh, rootlings come out of the field nursery and you can hold them above your head and the roots are touching the ground. So I know there's a huge amount of potential um, in that one year old plant. So this highlights to me that if you put the work into site preparation, you can unleash this potential and ensure that you're back to maximizing yield and quality as early in the vineyard life as possible. And the second point I want to make is don't inhibit the potential of your planting material by rushing planting. Take your time and get it right. Create clear specifications for your contractor and be present when they plant so that you can avoid problems like J-rooting, such as in this photo. And J-rooting occurs when planting is rushed, rootlings are just jammed in the ground and the roots are not properly oriented. Vines suffer terribly from J-rooting. They put a huge amount of energy in trying to reorientate those roots downwards rather putting the energy into growing um, shoots. So we've come to an end. Um, I've just got a final summary here. So in my mind, um, plan ahead, order, order at least 18 months in advance of planting. Remember that bringing planting material onto your property is a high biosecurity risk, so manage the risk. Remember that accreditation is only a starting point and develop a relationship with your nursery. Ask questions and make quality assurance your responsibility. And you can't do enough preparation, whether that's in the decision-making process or in preparing your vineyard. And finally, don't rush planting. The vines will be there for hopefully the next 50 years. So take your time and get it right. Uh, thank you to your lumber nursery for the pictures, uh, AWRI for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, thank you all for your attendance. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Nick. Really. Excellent presentation. We've had some really strong feedback come through as, as you've been talking, so I think it's been well received. Um, as Nick's already indicated, we are going to roll into a QA and a from here. So Nick will stick around for a little while. If you've got any questions you want to ask, then please send them through. Um, ideally use the Q&A button, but I see that a number of people are using the chat function as well, and that's also fine. Okay. So first question, Nick, um, in the event you 
you get a root stock and it does contain a virus, where does the responsibility start and finish with the nursery? Um, so if you buy rootlings and it has virus, is that the question? Yeah. Yep. Where does the responsibility lie? So, so one thing to, to really understand is that at the current sampling rates at 0.5%, you're looking at five vines in 1,000. Now, uh, even if there's been regular sampling for the last five years, that's 25 vines um, uh, in 1,000. Is my maths correct? Anyway, it's not a, not a huge amount. Um, yeah. and, and when you get results like that, what it really means is that, um, sorry, that's, uh, my maths is incorrect, but so they're not testing for all you're not testing all vines. You're only testing a, a random assortment every year. So, you know, where does the responsibility lie? Well, it, that's a really hard question. It's, it, it doesn't really lie necessarily with the nurseries. It doesn't necessarily rely with vine improvement either. So, because they're purchasing cuttings from vine improvement um, or they might be getting it from their own vineyards. So, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure if I can really answer that. Um, uh, oh. I give a reasonable answer. A tricky one, case by case, I guess. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here about what the best Merlot clones would be. Do you have any recommendations around that? Um, yeah, so I, the, when I was with uh, Yolumba Nursery, um, we did a, a, quite a bit of um, trial work. So, you know, the, this is a very quick history, but D3B14 was that first Merlot clone that came into Australia. Um, we did some testing of that clone against 8R and Q4514. Uh, in the work that we've, we did with winemaking, we found that both Q45 and 8R, um, you know, I would say were probably superior to, to D3B14 in, in the um, wine that was produced. So uh, those two clones are definitely worth having a look at. And then on top of that, uh, more recently, there were some imports of uh, French clones, uh, 181 and 343. I'm probably more familiar with 181, and I definitely think that that's a, that's a clone um, that's worth looking at. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've also got a question here about deep ripping prior to planting. Do you have any specific rec recommendations around? Uh, look, I think it's, you know, site specific, but definitely... Um, breaking up soil to allow the movement of uh, or the rapid colonization of roots is a positive thing because in my mind the more uh, rapidly roots colonize the soil the quicker you will be getting um, maximum yield and uh, you know optimal quality okay and would you recommend using fit vine to inspect vine material uh, it's a good question um, Look, I think it's a good, it's a really good um, app. Uh, and uh, you know, again, it's a really good starting point. If you've never dissected a vine before, um, then it's a, it is a very good starting point. Okay. Um, question also about Austrian or German nurseries. Do you have any recommendations for a, a nursery based in Austria or Germany? I have no contact with any nurseries in Austria or Germany, sorry. Yep. Um, I've also got a question here. Um, after pulling an existing vineyard due to disease, is it best to fallow ground for a year or fumigate or both before um, a new planting? Uh, really depends very much on what disease it is. Um, if it was virus, then fallowing white, so if we go back to that example of leaf roll three in remnant roots, those remnant roots can remain, let's say, active for quite some time. So in that instance, uh, fallowing or fumigation, you know, the fumigation, yes, might kill the, the mealybug. Um, but, you know, that virus might remain in those roots until, you know, another population of mealybug might come back uh, into that void. Um, for other diseases, I mean, again, it's a very much a case by case basis, but, you know, I think there's probably evidence to suggest that fallowing is a, if you can allow the vineyard to fallow and you can um, give it some time um, to regenerate and ameliorate those soils, um, you know, that, that that's a positive thing. Okay, thanks, Nick. 
Um, do you have any thoughts on pre-plant fertilizer or soil amendments that may improve vineyard health or longevity? Um, oh, again, look, it's it's a case by case basis. I, you know, it's to be honest, it's not something I've really ever um, delved into a great deal. I reckon that's a that's a really good um, question to ask of your local um, uh, chemical and um, fertilizer suppliers, the guys that are actually on the ground. Um, going out to a lot of different vineyards and seeing different results. Sure. Um, which reach stocks would you recommend for a MV6 Pinot in cool climate clay loam soils? Uh, look, I think, again, you know, I need to know a bit more about the site, but uh, we have seen success with 5C Teleki. Uh, we've also seen success with 101.14, but of course, particularly with 101.14, you've got to remember that it's got riparia in its parentage, so it can get a bit thirsty. So you need to make sure you have a good irrigation system and preferably it's not on a, a site that's sort of, you know, west facing and getting, um, you know, smashed by the, the hot afternoon sun. Um, so, you know, those two rootstocks have done, uh, have performed well. 3309C would be the other one. Uh, it hasn't been all that widely planted in Australia, but if you looked at uh, on a sort of a, a well global, if you look at you know Burgundy, New Zealand, um, the premium uh, Pinot Noir regions in uh, in North America, three three hundred nine C is the most widely planted rootstock. So um, I would definitely have a look at, at that one. Okay, uh, I've got a question here. Let me read it. Do you produce vines with material coming from mother blocks or from commercial blocks? Uh, so a nursery will... Mm -mm. So a lot of source blocks are also commercial um, vineyards. So whereas a, a rootstock mother block will just be producing rootstock cuttings, obviously, because there's no fruit on it. But uh, with respect to sign, um, there's not too many um, source blocks out there that are just for for cuttings. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, I guess the, the, the safer source blocks are probably those that are, you know, geographically isolated from um, uh, commercial vineyards to, you know, limit any spread. Um, but most of them are dual purpose. Yep. And do you have any thoughts about using root stimulants when planting? Uh, yeah, look, we, we did a little bit in the nursery and look, I'm sure they have a, an effect, but you know, just on a, we, we did a lot of, we, we were just looking at them visually and we couldn't see a massive, difference in terms of the top growth. Um, but, uh, you know, we never really got down to the nitty gritty of, of really having a close look at, um, you know, root mass that was being formed. Um, but look, I mean, with any of these uh, root stimulants, it, it's, it's definitely worth having a, having a try on your vineyard and, you know, keeping a control section aside so you can determine for yourself um, at your particular site whether um, that's going to work. Mm -hmm. um... Any recommendations for nutrient additions at time of planting? Lime and gypsum have already been added and green manure crops planted. I, again, um, yeah, sorry. This Philip from Shamora. Oh, hi, Philip. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, again, case by case. I mean, I, again, I, you know, it's not really my area of expertise. So I've always been a bit hesitant to um, add too much to these sorts of conversations. Uh, again, I, I'd be sort of, you know, talking to, to locals and local um, resellers of fertiliser um, and probably going directly to uh, soil agronomists um, to get some, some feedback. Sure. Um, have you seen symptoms of Pinot Gris virus? And what do you think the extent of this virus will be in Australia? You know? a long-term sense oh that's a curly one um have i seen not uh not uh in the flesh so to speak um i've certainly seen symptoms um uh in, in photos what would the long-term impact be what you know it's too early to tell 
but the very preliminary information, and I say preliminary information that we're getting out of Europe is that it doesn't appear to be, um, I gotta be careful what I say, but it doesn't appear to be a virus that's going to, you know, it's not gonna be as bad as say leaf roll three or red blotch or fan leaf or, or, or one of those really, you know, economically um, detrimental viruses. Okay. Um, do you have any experience with plantings by machine? Uh, not, um, we had a, oh, I'd say a fairly large client who used machine planting and uh, I believe they had a, um, a positive experience, uh, you know, they were planting some significant, um, areas and yeah, they, they had a, um, a good experience with respect to, you know, efficiencies and, um, yeah, or, and, and cost per vine to plant. Okay. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the pros and cons of taking cyan material from your own vineyard for the nursery to graft with? Um, look, as long as you're following, you know, a number of, you know, key, um, you know, rules. So making sure that you've done, uh, you, you, you do the source block inspection, um, you do the virus testing, um, you know, making sure that you're following all the, you know, hygiene procedures, you know, realistically your own block, um, as long as you're doing the right thing is, is no different as a source block to the source blocks that, you know, nurseries might be using. So yeah, as long as you're ticking all the boxes, uh, and, and particularly with respect to, you know, virus testing, um, and, and general inspections, um, I can't see, uh, any issues necessarily with that. Okay. A uh, question here that specifically relates to bushfire impact vines and GTD. Do you know whether the heat from the vine kills the pathogens in the vine? That the heat from the fire rather kills the pathogens in the vine? Oh, no idea. Sorry. Um, I would be talking to Mark Sosnowski from Sardi. He would be your man um, to answer that question. Um, also a question here about whether you know what the virus in the Nero Devola, Devola clone that is in this country, do you know any information? Do you have any information about that virus? I, I don't have any information on that. Sorry. No, we knew it was a, uh, it, uh, yeah, it wasn't, um, one of our, when I say our, your lab nurse would never, um, uh, we wouldn't have any source box of that particular clone or that particular, particular variety. Sure. Okay, looks like we may have run through all our questions, Nick. Um, yeah. If we get a last one or two, then I'll, I'll let you know. But before we start to wrap, wrap up, did you have any final? Uh, we've, got a, we've got a comment here from Prue, I think maybe in reference to the previous question indicating it LV, LRV3. Does that ring? Oh yeah, LRV3, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, did you want to make any final comments before we start to, to wrap this up, Nick? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Um, again, just thanks everyone um, for the questions and uh, for your attendance. Great, thank you. Yeah, big thanks to Nick for uh, yeah, providing some really key learnings around this topic. Um, a lot to get through and a lot of questions, which, um, which is great to see. Thank you also to the audience for, uh, for logging in. We're getting a few positive feedback question, uh, comments here, Nick. So I think it's been well received. Um, all our attendees will receive a link to this recording. Um, that should come through to you tomorrow. Um, next week's session is uh, the third of the five sessions which were designed to assist growers with vineyards recovering from fire damage. And at this penultimate session for the series takes place on the 14th of May. Richard Hamilton from Hamilton Viticulture will be joining to discuss winter pruning and preparation. Uh, if you haven't registered for this, then please visit the AWRI website to do so. Thank you again to Nick and to everyone that's logged in. Uh, hope to see you at the next AWRI webinar.